Okay, so that's very depressing, and, and people were indeed very depressed. Um, now, now, some people, mathematicians, sort of economists, were really excited because it was something fun to work on and it was completely new. Like people hadn't been working on it in that way and then he came along and did it and like, ah, here's a whole new way of looking at the world and they, you know, they spent like 30 years like really hammering at this and we know a lot about this now. Um, and it is indeed really, really general. It, it's sad but it's true. But, but if you think about it, this isn't the way we did anything else in economics, right? No, oh, yeah, it's just what we said a minute ago. He's using completely general preferences, right? We don't let people prefer A, B, and C however they like as long as they're transitive. Not completely general, he does enforce transitivity, but other than that, it's completely general. There's no other requirements on preferences whatsoever. And, and that could be, right? It, you know, we, we don't know what people like. It, could, we could be voting on some kind of beauty contest and you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder and you might like this one and not that one. And the other one, right? There's not necessarily any structure to that. But a lot of things that we care about, we might know more about preferences than we've put in so far. Right? And so when we were thinking about doing things, say in microeconomics, we did it very differently. Like when we had two goods, like A, B, and C, X1, so we have three packages, A, B, and C of goods, right? Put them, we have X1 is one of the goods, we have X2 is the other goods, and we have these three packages. We didn't say, well, maybe you like C best and then B and then A. We said, no, no, we know something about these things, right? We know in particular that in most of our economic stories, more is better, right? Now, it's not necessarily always the case, but, but you know, most of the things we're talking about for most of the situations that we're talking about in economics, we are resource constrained. We do not have the budget that we wish we had, and if we had a higher budget, we would get more of lots of stuff. And so we are restricting ourselves on lots of the things that we want because our, we're budget constrained. Not true for Bill Gates, not true for Warren Buffett, but for most of us, we're restricting our spending because we've got a budget, right? Now maybe you're restricting your spending a lot, maybe you're not restricting it that much, but in general, of the things you want, you can't have them all, and so you tend to cut back on all of them, right? And so you would like more of all the good things in life. In particular, you would like more of X1, and you would like more of X2. We assumed, right? it's not necessarily true. It is possible to have too much milk and have it go bad in your fridge. Right, so that, that is a possibility, but we don't normally buy that much milk because why would you fill your, your, your fridge with milk if it's gonna rot? You would, you know, you have a budget constraint, why waste money on that? You cut back on your milk consumption so that you can buy other things rather than have it in your fridge to rot. So we don't normally buy up to the point where we start having these things be a problem. We buy up to the point where our, we're trading off buying a little more of this one versus buying a little more of the other one. So we say, for typical economics problems, not always, but we say more is better, right? And A has more of both X1 and X2 than B. So A has got to be better than B for everybody, right, if this is true. And we say, well, more is better, and C has more of both goods than A does, so he, C has got to be better than A. So we impose that structure on preferences. We don't let everybody in our, in our standard story have any old preferences under the sun. They can't like B better than A and C better than B. We, we require this order for this particular set of, of packages of goods, right? And that's what gives us the structure to say when prices go up, people consume less of something, right? The whole structure of microeconomics is really built around this structure that we impose on preferences. And for loads and loads of things, that's a perfectly reasonable structure to impose on preferences. So for lots and lots of things, this thing is useful. Right? Now there are some examples where it's not. Right? If, you, if you really want to look at Bill Gates' consumption patterns, maybe this isn't as useful because he's got everything that he wants, stuff-wise. He doesn't have love. I'm just saying. <laughs> Well, maybe he does, but it's not from his wife, that's for sure. <laughs> but, you know, for, in terms of buying stuff, he's got what he wants. So maybe this doesn't work so good for Bill, right? But for most of us, for most of the things that economists are concerned about, this is perfectly reasonable. 
Right? We think, yeah, you, you can disagree, right? But that, that's how we proceeded from microeconomics one on. Okay? We also made more assumptions, which are, are a little more dubious, saying that goods had diminishing marginal rates of substitution. That is, when you go out on Halloween, the first candy you get gives you a lot of happiness. The second candy is also great. The third candy is nice to have. The fourth candy is pretty good. The 50th candy is making you ill. Right? And so we, we impose for a lot of things that diminishing marginal rate of substitution, which gives us the indifference curves the way that they're drawn. Right? We, well, we normally draw them. And that's a little more dubious, because for that to, to work, you really need to, to say a lot more about how things are related to each other. But for lots of things, that's quite reasonable as well. And we can and be happy with that. Right? So we impose a lot of structure in microeconomics on people's preferences. And so far, we haven't imposed really any structure on people's preferences in, in political theory, in voting theory. Right? Mr. Arrow says, OK, given that people have transitive preferences, eh, that's lovely, we get these goofy things with voting. And, there, and the way it comes out is that there can be some set of preferences in the group so that we get these goofy things. Well, maybe those some set of preferences in the group are things that aren't very likely in real life anyway. Like maybe if we started thinking more about what people are voting over and the kind of, kind of preferences are, that are reasonable in that situation, maybe that's going to eliminate a lot of the stuff that Arrow's worried about. Okay. So the first line of attack on, these, on the Condorcet paradox and all was, OK, maybe we can have a better voting system, and that'll solve the problem. That's not true. Okay. Sad, but it's not true. But the second line of attack is to think, well, maybe we've been posing this too generally um, so that really maybe there's more, more going on in voting than we, we've said. And maybe we're voting about particular things where we can impose more structure on, on people's preferences. And maybe that will, will deal with the problem. Okay. All right. What do we got? OK, so let's put some, some structure on people's political choices. Like, and this really is, is sort of talking about what are we voting over anyway, right? And so if we know what we're voting over, maybe we can say what's reasonable for people to, to want and what's not. Right? Now, people want what they want, right? You, know, you can say people, you know, people should be reasonable about what they want, but you know, some people pay for BDSM and all, so you don't know what people want, right? But, be reasonable for most of the people most of the time. What are we going to assume about their preferences? All right. So let's suppose, just to start us off, that our political choice is something that has a natural order to it. There's a, 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 a notion of more versus less. Okay. Now, this isn't always true, but it's often true. Okay. We could be, for example, thinking about what tax rate should we set. What should be the highest tax rate? Should it be 42%? Should it be 40%? Should it be 38%? Should it be 2%? What is the tax rate that we want? And there's a natural sense that of more versus less in that. Right? A higher tax rate is higher taxes. There's a good side to that. There's a bad side to that. Right? The good side is we raise more money. The bad side is they take more money from us. Right? And, and everything that's associated with both of those. They raise more money. They can give us more services. They take more money from us. We can't buy stuff, it, you know, growth issues. So there's a balancing act, but there's definitely a natural order. 50 is bigger than 40, right? Okay. If we want to punish murderers, not for debate whether we do or not, but if we want to pu punish murderers, how many years should they go to prison? Okay. People have different views on this. Right? We can, can say, I want them gone, gone for life. I want them for 10 years. They'll be re rehabilitated in that. But there is definitely a sense that 10 years is less than life. So there's a natural order to this kind of thing. Um, what percentage of our tax revenue should we give, give to social insurance? Right? It's a percentage. We can give all of it to social insurance, which means we can't do other things. Or we can do very little of it to social insurance, meaning we can do lots of other things, but not so much social insurance. Um, and you know, lots of stuff has a natural order. A lot of things that we care about, right? how much should we pay for it? How many, how many fire departments should we have? Right? It's costly, but it's nice to have to put out the fires. And it's a natural order. There's a sense that there's more, and there's a sense that there's less. Right? All right. 
Now, people still have different opinions about these things. Just because there's a natural order doesn't mean higher is better or lower is better. People have different opinions. Right? There's a, you know, I might think that the, the best tax rate is 45%. You might think that the best tax rate is 30%. That's perfectly reasonable in both cases. No, you're wrong, obviously. But, but it's perfectly reasonable. Right? To have a different opinion than me. I don't know how you do it. But anyway, you can have a different opinion than me. That's, that's perfectly fine, and you can justify that, and you may even be right. right? Okay. Ah, there you go. But if I think it's 40%, suppose I think that the best tax rate is 40%, just suppose, there's still a lot more we can say about my preferences now that we've put this natural order on thing. If my ideal tax rate is 40%, probably moving away from that makes me less happy in either direction. Right? And so if I think that the ideal rate is 40%, then I think 45% is too high. I wouldn't like it as much as 40%. Right? On the other hand, 50% is even farther from my ideal. So probably I would like it even less. Right. And same is true going in the other direction. I would think that 35% is too low. And I would think that 30% 30, 30 is even worse. Right. And so we are going to assume that, that we have a structure, a, a natural order to our, the thing we're deciding, and that we have what's called single peak preferences. That is, we have an ideal point, and the farther we move away from that ideal point, the less happy we are. Okay. Now, in terms of moving away, like I'm a voter and I've got my ideal, I, ideal of 40%. If the government gives me 40%, it's bliss. If the government gives me 45%, I'm sad. And if the government gives me 50%, I'm even sadder. Right? And you, your ideal might be 30%. And then the 45% is ridiculously high and the 50% is just stupid, but still you're getting sadder. Right? So we have these single peak preferences. So that's going to be our, our basic structure. And for a lot of things that we think about voting on, this seems, at least to a lot of people, reasonable. You, know, you can decide for yourself how reasonable you think it is. Okay. So for our policy space, we need something with a natural order. And we are going to arbitrarily put that on the range from 0 to 1. 1 is the highest. Zero is the lowest. Because it has a natural order, we can do this. It doesn't need to be something that's ne necessarily measurable. It could be how mean should we be to people when they go to prison. Right? Zero could be we should be very nice to them so they learn a skill and learn how to behave with humans and maybe become better people when they go out. And one could be we should whip them and we should beat them and we should, should rub their nose in poop and we should make sure that they never want to come back here. But there's a natural order to that. I call one of them zero, and I call one of them one, and everything in between. Okay. So it doesn't have to really be a numerical thing, but we are going to, to fix these numbers on it just so we can talk about it. Okay. Okay. Tax rates are kind of obvious. It's just a fraction, right? So it's, it's nice. But, but other things, non-numerical things, work fine. Like, you know, how much should we wave the flag on Patty's Day? as a society. Should we, should we you know, try and make a big splash in the world or we should, should we keep it quiet? We would put that on zero to one as well. It's not really numerical, but it's, you know, it's a thing we can choose as a society. Okay. So a po particular policy is out, out of this voting or some mechanism, we're going to get a particular policy, which will be a number between zero and one which is the thing that we're enacting. Okay. It's going to be 0.63. We're going to be pretty mean to prisoners, but not too mean. Right? Or it's going to be 3. We're going to be a little nicer to prisoners, maybe give them a skill, but also like kick them occasionally just so they know where they are. Uh, we, get, we have a whole, whole range of these things, and we're just going to pick a particular policy somehow through our whole mechanism. Right? Each individual has their ideal policy on this line. Um, it's a particular number between 0 and 1. And their utility is highest if that's the policy that gets enacted by whatever mechanism enacts it. And the farther you move away from that, the less happy they are. Okay. Okay. 
So here is somebody with a nice, well-behaved single peak preferences. Right? They have their ideal policy, and the farther we move away from it, the lower their utility. Of course, these can be curved or whatever, but, but that's the idea. If we get zero, they get this low level of utility. If we get one, they get this even lower level of utility. And then the closer you get to their ideal policy, the happier they get. Okay, people with me here. And so then the question is, does this help with our, with our problem? Right? Does it solve the kind of problems that Arrow was, was on about? Okay. So let's go back to our Condorcet example and see whether that satisfies single peak preferences. Okay. So we had this example. We had Mr. 1 liked A better than B, better than C. Mr. 2 liked B better than C, better than A, and so on. And we want to see whether those can be represented with single peak preferences. Or was, in constructing this special case, did I have to violate single peak preferences? And this isn't going to be a proof of anything, obviously, but this is going to be giving us, giving us an idea whether imposing this kind of structure is likely to be helpful. Right? Because if all these were single peak preferences, we would know that single peak preferences are not going to solve all of our problems. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, they gave us that. So to do this, we need to impose a natural order. And in that example, there was no natural order. But I will say, like when we voted over, over um, when the exam date was, there was a natural order. Right? Week six is, in a, in a real sense, less than week seven, which is, in a real sense, less than week nine. Right? So there's a natural order to that. You could be a person who really hates hates to do things now and wants to put it off because, you know, you could be hit by a truck or win the lottery or something, and then you wouldn't have to take the exam. Um, so, you know, the longer you put it off, the more chance you have of winning the lottery between now and then, so as later as possible. So there's a real sense in which moving it later for a person that's expecting to win the lottery might be a good thing. Okay. Okay. So, but, but in our general Condorcet story, there was nothing like that. So it could be that what was going on in, is in our little class vote, there was this natural order to things, whereas in, in the Condorcet example, there was no natural order to things, and that's where the difference is coming from. Right? Could be. Right. So I'm going to arbitrarily uh, say that A is a lower policy than B, which is a lower policy than C in this, this sort of policy space. Now, you can try different orders. You can have B higher than A, right? it, and it won't matter. You'll get the same. Same results. And in fact, you should probably try this at home. Pick a different arbitrary order and see if the same sort of results come about. And, and I, trust me, they will. Well, don't trust me. Check and, and find out that they will. You should never trust me. That, that's I, a sucker game. Trust your, trust your lecturer. OK, so here we go. I have our 0, 1 policy space. And I got A is less than B, which is less than C. But this is not preferred less than. It's just this is the natural order. And then we want to try to represent the, these utility functions here, right? give a utility function that matches up with these preferences, and see whether that utility function is single peaked or not. Okay? So for the first guy, if I can find a pen, for the first guy, we're told that A is the best. Let me get rid of this. This is just going to get in my way. A is the best, so let's give him some utility. And remember, utility numbers are always arbitrary. Right? It's an arbitrary number that we're giving just to represent the happiness that he gets, and so we give him that amount. Okay. But now we have B is, is not, huh, B is, A is preferred to B. So if we're trying to represent this ordering by a utility function, we have to give him a lower utility for B than we gave him for A. Right? So when we get to B, he needs a lower utility. So we can give him this. And then he likes that more than C. So we have to get, make the C lower than that. And here we have his utility function, as far as we know, I'm just filling in the middle for no, no particular need to, but we're filling in the middle. Um, and this, this is single peaked, right? This is 
the highest point, and if it went, you know, we don't know what happens over here, but if it went down, it would still be single peaked. If it went up all the way, it would still be single peaked. We can represent this set of preferences with a single peaked utility function for this guy. So A is good, A is good. Mr. One is good, like he, he's got a single peak preference. Okay. And let me just, just to, to sort of emphasize the point, let me just sort of send that out like that. So in this case, this guy's peak would be at zero, for instance. But that we can represent these preferences. This is all we know about him is A is better than B, better than C. And we can represent those with the single peak preferences. So we're good. Okay, now Mr. Two. I will do Mr. Two in green, I suppose. Green, and we're told that B is the best for Mr. Two. So let me put it up here. That's not green. B is the best for him. And then C is less good than B, so it's got to be lower. And A is the worst, so it has to be even lower than C. So let me put it down here. And I can represent this guy's utility function like this. So this is Mr. Two, and this is I. Mr. One, right? So that's single peaked as well. Right, there's just one peak at B, and everything else move in either direction, things get worse. Okay? So for both guy one and guy two, we can represent their utility functions with single peak preferences. Okay? Now we get to Miss Three. And we're told that she likes C the best. So I'll put it way up here. No, I'll put it way up here. Okay? That's what she likes best. This is, this is three. And then her next best is A. So I'll go over here and put it here. And then her worst is B. So I have to put it lower than A. I have to give her a utility number that's less than, than A so that we're representing her preferences. And so hers looks like that. And her preferences are not single peaked, right? Because there's sort of a, a peak coming up here, and there's a peak coming up here. Now, this one may be higher than that one, but still there's two, two maximum, right? local maximums of this thing. So this, Miss Three, is violating the assumptions that we're putting on this problem, which is super encouraging. I know it sounds, sounds bad, but it's super encouraging because it says that Maybe in order to get this Condorcet paradox, we needed to have preferences that were not single peak. Was there a question back there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you not say that her single peak preference is just an extreme? She doesn't care why it is as long as it's on one spectrum or the other. She doesn't want it. Right. You could say that, and that would be perfectly fine. And an individual could have that kind of preferences, but it wouldn't be our single peak preferences that we're trying to impose. Okay, so yeah, like I can come up with like lots of reasonable examples where somebody wouldn't have single peak preferences. In fact, I'll come up with a couple in a minute, right? So it's perfectly reasonable to think this moderate thing is, is really what's getting into trouble. Like if we're gonna do something, let's do it big, either direction. And if we're just sort of wishy-washing around, eventually the whole, you know, everything's gonna come to ruin. We have to do either go big or go home, right? And that's perfectly reasonable thing to say perfectly reasonable preferences to have, but we're assuming that we don't have them. That's what we're going to, right. right. Which is to say that we're actually assuming something of importance, right? It's, it's not just an innocuous, sure, we can do it, and everything's fine. There's really a sense in which we're assuming away some things that might happen in reality, right? People might have these things. And so you really have to think, how reasonable is it to think that people have single peak preferences, right? Now, I did it this way. Now, if you, and I, I really suggest at home, you try it, like say B is, is higher than A is higher than C. Put them a different order on your line here. And you will have a different person that doesn't have single peak preferences, right? So you'll, if you put a different order of them on the line, Ms. Three will have single peak preferences, but one of the other ones won't. So it, it's, it's, it is the case that whatever order you put these, these three things, 
one of the guys has to not have single peak preferences in this particular example, which is super encouraging because a lot of people think that sing single peak preferences are pretty reasonable for a lot of situations. Um, so if you're one of those people, then that's going to be very encouraging and we can think maybe there might be hope that we get around the arrow and possibility result. Because remember, arrows and possibility result was saying there could exist in the population some set of preferences where this voting system leads to ridiculous things. Right? But if we're saying, no, no, you can't have any preferences at all, we're, we're going to restrict the set of preferences, then maybe there doesn't exist a set that's restricted in that way so that we get ridiculous things. And this is encouraging in that direction. Right? So we have one example where we don't have single peak preferences, where, where you really, you know, you, you want to go big or go home, you don't want to be sort of wishy-washy in the middle, and that's perfectly reasonable, and, and there, you can certainly think of other examples like that. I think, I think you can. If you put your mind to it, you can. Um, There's other sort of now you can think of lots of ways in which you, you could have this, but you could think, for example, like when should we prohibit abortion, for instance? And there's a natural order to that, right? You can say we should never, uh, never. Um, Prohibited at all, it's between a doctor and a woman. Or you could say we should not have abortion at all, and it should be, we're prohibited at zero minutes, and everything in between, right? And you can imagine single peak preferences on this, right? You can imagine someone says it should be legal up to 40 weeks, and it should be illegal after that. Right? And then the farther you move away from that, the less happy they are. You, you can certainly imagine a person like that with single peak preferences on this. Right? Um, may or may not be you, but you can imagine such a person, I, I'm hoping. Okay? But you could also think that it's not, like suppose I thought that really, really we should just allow abortion whenever it's between a woman and her doctor and I don't want to get, don't think we have the authority or the, the moral authority to get involved in that. They should decide it between themselves and, and we just wish them the best, right? Maybe that's my true belief. And then you would be tempted to draw my utility function like this, right? My I, ideal policy is one and then the farther we get away from that, the less happy I am. Right. Now, that's a perfectly reasonable way to think about it, but it's also true that there's more to this than that. So this could be my, my honest belief, but if, for example, the government came in and said, I want one week. We're going to allow abortions up to one week, and after that they're going to be forbidden. Now, I might think, that's basically outlawing them, right? Nobody even knows they're pregnant up to one week. And so what's the point? It's just outlawing it, but it's not saying you're outlawing it, right? So I might think that some people will be fooled and think that we're permitting abortions and there won't be pressure to relax the law. And so I might like that, that policy less than a complete ban, right? Because if there's a complete ban, it's clear in everyone's head, and then we can put pressure to change the law. Right, so even if this is sort of, I might actually prefer a ban to that. Even though I have this sort of natural order in my head, given the reality of life and the fact that one week is basically a ban anyway, but it might fool some people, I might prefer a complete ban to that, in which case we don't have single peak preferences. Right? Which is just to say, if you start to think about human, actual human beings and actual laws and actual things that we think about when we're, when we're voting, and you think about them in any degree of sophistication, there's lots of times when you think, eh, single peak preferences, maybe kind of, but not exactly really, right? So you shouldn't take this as just given. Like, we're going to do a lot of stuff with single peak preferences, and we're going to pretend like that's the thing, but 
Life is more complicated than that. Humans are more complicated than that. And we may be throwing things out when we do this. Right? Just like when we were, were doing, doing consumer theory and drew those indifference curves and the diminishing marginal rate of substitution. You know, there's some things that you like more and more. The more you, the more you eat them, the first time you taste caviar, you don't like it, and then you're addicted, and you're eating the salty fish eggs all the time. Right? It's, the, some things are an acquired taste, and so it's not the case that you have diminishing marginal rate of substitution. You actually hate the first five, and then you're, you're addicted to meth, and, and then it's great from then on. Um, there's lots of things like that, right? And we're simplifying the world by doing that. And the thought is that we're simplifying it in a way that gives us insights, but we should never think that it's actually literally true. We, we should think through these things. And the same is true here. We're going to be using these single peak preferences. I think, and lots of people think, that they're pretty reasonable lots of the time. But they are not carved in stone. Actual human beings, actual life is more complicated. And we should always come back and like, re-examine, does it make sense in this particular situation? Okay. Nevertheless, we're going to go with it from here on out. Okay. Not from here on out. For a while, for a while, we're going to go with it. Right. Questions about this? Right. Okay. So all of this is going to be useful and interesting to the extent that you buy the single peak preference things as being broadly capturing something real for a lot of the kind of problems we vote on. Okay. And to the extent that you don't, you'll find it. You know, you know, go hang out with Arrow. You and the Nobel Prize winning guy. <laughs>